court, space law, or the extraterrestrial history of the United States of America is now in the session. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by introducing our judges. My name is Carl Crystal. To my right is Nathan Goldman. And to my left is Raymond Fender. Our prosecutors are James Foley and Bruce Brown. Serving as counsel for the defense are Dan Dan General Burns and William <coughs> Wirren. But these are very eminent individuals, I should like to know. And they are distinguished in their field and are very exceedingly well qualified to participate in this trial today. What I will now say is intended to serve as an introduction to the trial of this case. It is not a substitute for the detailed instructions on the law of evidence which we will give to you at the close of the case. And before you retire, consider your verdict. This is a criminal case uh, commenced by the United States, which I may sometimes refer to as the prosecution and sometimes as the government. The case is against Barbara Griffith and Dwight Mack. They are the defendants. The case is based on an indictment which reads as follows. Indictment for attempted murder in outer space. It is, as I said before, a case before the United States Court of Space Law or the Extraterrestrial District. The case entitled the United States of America versus Barbara Griffith and Dwight Mack. And we are proceeding under Section 18 of the United States Code, uh, one, 1,113. The grand jury has charged as follows. On or about the 6th of February, 2035, in the extraterrestrial district of the United States, while subject to the special maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States, Barbara Griffith and Dwight Mack attempted to murder Peter Bruno by forcibly ejecting him from the airlock of an outer space facility with full knowledge that Peter Bruno's death was the probable result of their act. This was signed by the foreman of the grand jury and by the United States attorney. You should understand that the indictment simply a charge and that it is not in any sense evidence of the allegations it contains. The defendants have pleaded not guilty to the indictment. The government therefore has the burden of proving each of the essential elements of the indictments beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the constitutional standard applicable to criminal cases beyond a reasonable doubt. The purpose of the trial is to determine whether the government has met this burden. Now I wonder where the jury is. Do we have a jury here? Hey, please, the court. The jury's been in the panel, and uh, now that the, the uh, courtroom has been informed of uh, the charges, we would like to go ahead and ask for volunteers and now it's this time. All right. Do so we have some volunteers in to come up here and serve as jurors? It's a murder trial. There's no age requirement in this particular jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have some people who would like to come up and sit as jurors? Six. We need at least six. Uh, Your Honor, the defense would object to the cavalier manner in which the prosecution seeks to gather together a standard report. <laughs> see a couple more because in, in the event that Please. Uh, some of them would not be yeah. here. At least six. We have seven or eight or ten. Please. Let's get a, a couple more. 
Yes, I mean, we object again to this unseemly procedure of having an unlimited number of jurors who are, whose qualifications seem to be to be alive and, and to be here. <laughs> Counsel, are you suggesting that you're not satisfied with any 12 good men and women? Well, uh, no, we're objecting to the system. I'm very sure that people are simple people, but the system of choosing them is much to be desired. Objection, Counsel. Your for the purpose of the record, I would like the jurors to introduce themselves. <coughs> Extreme right here. Would you please stand and give us your name and uh, thank you. Dennis Appel, professionally and in retail. Right, Dallas Bainhoff, engineer. Sherry Lowry, uh, contracts specialist. Ron Jones, engineering. Henry Salato, student. Mike Shaw, I'm an engineer by trade and I'm also a member of the National Board. Uh, Dee Dee Dewey, student. Bob Hillhouse, I used to be an IRS agent, but I have an honest job now. I'm a stockbroker. Paul Words, workman's compensation insurance. The prosecution has no problem with this jury, and uh, we have no challenges. Uh, you are, they are very you know, qualified, and they will be the first jury in a space case. Uh, Your Honor, the uh, defense would ask uh, one question of the impaneled jury. Uh, has any member of the jury uh, had an opportunity to live in space and to participate uh, in space life? <laughs> you have. <laughs> no, I, is it permissible to make a point? Stand, please. Have the defendants or the, uh, any of the uh, uh, teams also uh, lived or worked in space? Yes, both the defendants have. Then can it be assumed that the uh, the jury would also have the same opportunity as? Well, that's my question. Has any member of the jury had that opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not, Your Honor. The defense therefore would challenge the entire panel because the defendants <laughs> have a right to be tried by a panel of their peers. If uh, there are no peers on this panel, then the defense believes that they cannot sit in judgment because they will not be able to properly be able to ascertain the kinds of motivations and the problems which the defendants encounter uh, in their space life. Counsel, are you suggesting that in order to try a drug case, the jurors would have to have direct experience with drugs? No, but I am suggesting <laughs> that they would have to have lived in the community uh, where the drug trafficking uh, occurred or be knowledgeable of it. Counsel, I'm going to overrule your objection. Feel free to renew it later if the facts demonstrate that there's peculiar knowledge the jurors don't have. Uh, may I now assume that the jury has been impaneled and uh, sworn, and we may proceed with the opening statement. Uh, the opening statement will be made by Mr. Brown. Will you please proceed, Mr. Brown. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the first space case to be in a courtroom that is not related to a contract matter. This is the first space crime or space tort. And from that standpoint, this is a landmark trial. The trial is about attempted murder. Murder is defined in the law as the unlawful killing of another with malice of forethought without legal justification or excuse. It would not be proper of the prosecution to comment upon what the expected defense, if any, will be. But there are two things about this trial that you should know. And the first thing is that this is about a crime in space, but it is not about something that the law has not envisioned that could happen. The legislators have seen fit to give jurisdiction to the courts to cover crimes in space. And there's nothing about the crime itself which relies upon space as being part of the offense. What I'm trying to say is 
This is not a case about murder in space. It's a case about murder. It just happens to have occurred in space. The law typically lags human progress. It lags commerce. It lags technology. But it does not lag human nature. This murder could have been committed 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. And the facts would still be the same. The attempted murder. There is, however, a second point which will really make this a landmark case. And that is that a computer, despite some pretrial things that have gone on that you would not have to be concerned with, a computer will testify in the courtroom today as a witness. This is the first time that that has happened. There may be some motions made to either quash or allow the testimony of the computer. Back in the, this is the year 2035, back in the second half of the 20th century, society wrestled with what life is from the sense of when does it begin. And that's the abortion issue. And if you recall, historically, at one point the Supreme Court had a very liberal attitude toward abortion and when life begins. And at another point, they backed off of that. The state legislatures took over. Congress refused to act on the issue. Talks of constitutional amendments were batted about. But the end result was that it's pretty much been a court kind of decision, even interpreting the state's different feelings about the abortion issue. We have the issue approached from another side when we talk about a computer testifying in court. As you know from the primitive beginnings in the second half of the 20th century in computers, we now have computers that are more intelligent than human beings. And they're more intelligent because they have been enhanced by technology to think faster and also to think in greater terms in the sense of quantity than human beings. So what we have is something that if it is accepted today and the testimony of the computer is accepted today, then we will be ushering in a new era. It's something along the lines of Hal from the old classic 2001 Space Odyssey. So bear in mind that this is truly not unique because it is a murder in space. It's a murder which happens to have, an attempted murder which happens to have occurred in space. As you can see, I keep referring to it as a murder, but as you will see, the victim of the attempted murder will testify, so it's not a murder. But it is about some new areas of human existence and human endeavor and whether or not the computers will perhaps ultimately rule. And that's something that you as a general will have the chance to decide upon. Now to the technical areas of the case. To define again for you, attempted murder is the attempt at an unlawful killing of another with malice of forethought without legal justification or excuse. You'll be receiving instructions from the eminent court about the technicalities of the case and the elements that must be proved and those kinds of things as we get to the end. But as a preview, you will hear the testimony of a number of individuals, including the intended victim, which will lay out the facts for you. The prosecution will then arrest its case. The defense will then make its choice about what it can do. And after that is over, you will take the testimony and the facts of the case and go in and make your decision in jury deliberations. Unlawful killing just means one that is not sanctioned by the state. For example, killing in a declared war is not murder. Malice of forethought, we'll talk about that some more as we develop the testimony of the witnesses. It just means that there was, before the actual act of the killing, an intent in mind of the defendants to do the act of the killing. Without legal justification or excuse, there are times in which the killing of another is either excused or justified. And an example of that is the diminished capacity or insanity. If 
the same person, what is the judge can say about a court, kill someone is not considered to be a murder, and they are capable of formulating the intent of malice of war talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown, for introducing the case uh, against the accused uh, as a prosecutor to have completed your opening statement. Now, I should like to turn to the opening statement to be made uh, by the um, defense. And I believe that is made by uh, Mr. William Guerra. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, the prosecution's opening statement is most interesting. Uh, he would have you believe that this is a very simple case, uh, meaning that it will not tax your abilities. Uh, I think he was ready for you to vote right now. Uh, what's even more interesting is I think he'd really like to prosecute a murder, but if he did, that he wouldn't have a witness. And I think he wants a witness to establish uh, whatever he believes he can. Uh, but I would suggest to you that the prosecution cannot have it both ways. And that's exactly what the prosecution will endeavor to prove to you today, is that they want it both ways. I think you're going to find some very interesting issues and some novel ones. This is not the standard case. He has said to you that this is a merely a murder which occurred in space. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because unless you understand the space environment and the problems and the pressures and the circumstances under which people in space live, you will never be able to understand the two defendants and the problems that occurred to them that evening, or I should say late in the morning, because the crime is alleged to have occurred shortly after midnight. In essence, the victim, quote unquote, entered their dwelling place without authority, was changing the computer program so that the asteroid on which they were on would crash into the occupied habitat and it would destroy their project. And all they did was exclude him from there so that they could go back to the computer, correct the program, and make sure that their lives and the lives of the other space inhabitants would be safe. That's a lie. They tried to kill me. I suggest, Your Honor, that either the victim be instructed to be quiet or be excluded from the court. The election victim, and witnesses not instructed, and there's another offers to be removed. The other alternative, Your Honor, which the defense would uh, entertain is to have him put in irons. <laughs> <laughs> But what the prosecution has not told you with regard to the defense is a couple of very significant factors. One, the question will be put to you by the prosecution that the defendants did not have any property right in the location which they built and which they were going to make available to others. I suggest to you, if that occurred, they would never have built the place in the first instance because you can't rent that which you do not own and do not have a right to. They built habitat so that other spacefarers would have a place to live. Secondly, the prosecution will deminimize and have you believe that there was not a threat of immediate harm to them and to the other space inhabitants in the area because of the malfunction caused by the alleged victim. These are critical points to the defense, and I think you'll understand them and see them as the case evolves. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel, I wonder if you could have the defendant stand. Please stand. Thank you, Counsel. Are we going to have some pretrial motions? The prosecution has The prosecution has no pretrial motion. The defense would make a pretrial motion to quash the indictment based on the fact that it is ludicrous for a society to attempt to judge those who are without their society. The essence of American law was that the laws of England should no longer apply once the United States became settled 
and once there were people here who could manage their own affairs. I suggest to you that that has happened at this point in time, in the year 2035, and that therefore the United States no longer has jurisdiction over these spacefarers because different rules, different problems occur to them and must be dealt with by them. And that this court, as the defense previously made a motion to the effect that this jury was not qualified to sit because they had not been spacefarers. Likewise, this court and its laws are not attuned to the problems which occur in space. And therefore, it is the spacefarers who must determine for themselves how they should be governed and what rules will apply to them. We could even call as one of our expert witnesses, Jack Glazer, to testify as to those kinds of issues should the court wish to have further testimony on the subject. The court has listened listen carefully to the um, statement <coughs> made by counsel for the defendants. Uh, counsel, this is a case of first instance. The issue of jurisdiction is obviously a critically important one. The uh, matter is so uh, critical that it may of necessity require an ultimate appeal from the final decision of this trial court. However, on the basis of the facts and the law as stated, uh, despite your objection, it is a feeling of this tribunal that the court does possess jurisdiction. <coughs> and therefore, your objection is duly noted. It will appear in the record of the, of the case, but the uh, objection is overruled, and we will proceed with the trial of the case. I therefore call upon the prosecution bring forward his first witness. People call Peter Britt up to the stand. Unfortunately, we uh, did bid, uh, I think, with some sort of espionage, but they uh, they got the contract. Uh, we bid on the same construct, construction contract, yes. And a little bit about your background. <clears throat> what is your, uh, your academic training? I'm uh, well trained. I've got a uh, PhD in a number of subjects and a uh, <laughs> master's in computer science and a uh, master's in economics also. I'm also an excellent uh, builder and owner Thank you, Mr. Bruno. Will you, in your own words, relate what happened on February 5th, uh, 2035? Yes, I remember that uh, a couple of my guys uh, left some uh, equipment out on this asteroid. This damn stuff uh, 
excuse me, sir, uh, this darn stuff uh, costs a lot of money. So um, I was at Island too, and I went to go get that stuff. I went out to the uh, asteroid to retrieve it, and I suddenly realized that the damn asteroid was moving. So uh, I quickly uh, surveyed the situation and uh, went into the dome area, because I knew enough about uh, the project to uh, know where the controls were in terms of attitude controls and the like. I went in the dome area, and I started uh, accessing the uh, computer access control, and the suddenly these guys burst in and tried to kill me. How did they try to kill you, sir? Well, I was standing at the computer controls just trying to gain access, and that guy there, he came by and just went crazy. Started pushing me back and moving controls and switching this and switching that. And she, she grabbed something and, and tried to get me. Big long object. I don't know what it was, but she, she tried to get me. And then things happened really fast. All of a sudden, all I knew was they were talking. I couldn't hear what they were saying. Next thing, I, I backed off a little bit. I was pushed in an airlock. Before I had time to do anything, I was out of the airlock, floating in space. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Mr. Brill, how was it that you escaped this deadly uh, encounter? Well, all I know is I was out there alone. My life flashed before me. <laughs> computer picked me up, as I understand it later, and sent out a vehicle to rescue me. And, but for that, I'd be a lonely stranger out of nowhere. Let the record reflect that the defense, uh, when he was referring to he and her in his testimony, was pointing at the defendants, Dwight Mack and Barbara Griffin. You're damn right, those guys. <laughs> you know, uh, Your Honor, we must object to this the witness and perhaps you can advise him to rambling on philosophically to answer the questions uh, in a, a truthful way, I hope, and, and do not wander all through space with us. It's a long trial. We'd like to move along. Mr. Sure, I have points well taken. You've obviously had a dramatic experience, and we appreciate that. But could you respond directly to the questions as much as possible? I'll try, sir. When they first burst in on you, the room. Did they consult with each other? All I knew was they were talking. I couldn't hear it. I saw their lips moving, but I don't know what they were saying. I tried to communicate with them, but we were on different radio frequencies or something. Can you expand a little bit upon why you uh, entered into the dome and what your intent was in terms of uh, Asteroid well, there I was on that uh, darn asteroid, just minding my own business, picking up my own equipment. And as I said, the damn thing was moving. So I, I know enough about these kinds of things to know that maybe I could save something or stabilize something. So my intent was to simply do that, access their controls, and do that. So it was unusual that the asteroid would be moving. Oh, yeah, you're, you're quite sure about that. That thing's supposed to be stable. Was it moving towards something? It was moving right towards the colony, yes, sir. So your sense was that the asteroid uh, would be impacting the colony, or at least threatening to, moving in that direction, and you were the only one that knew of that, and your attempt was to stop that. As far as I knew, that whole Asteroid was abandoned. I was the only stranger on the island. You did not know the defendants were in the dome? No, I only found out, I don't know what they were doing in that dome, but uh, I thought I was alone at the time, and I thought I was just being the savior of the whole colony. The people have no further questions, Joe. Can I go? A couple of questions, if you don't mind. We realize your time is quite valuable. Uh, you're an expert in many things, as you've testified. Uh, what are the rules of uh, uh, flight? Uh, 
traveling out to that asteroid. Can you tell me what they are? Yeah, you're supposed to file a uh, flight plan whenever you leave the uh, colony and uh, go anywhere within the zone of their influence. And you filed one that night? No, I, I, I didn't file one that night, no. I see. What are the normal working hours uh, in space uh, in that locale? Uh, well, if I remember correctly, it was uh, 7 to 5, 7 to 6, something like that. And you went out to the asteroid for what purpose? Uh, to get my damn equipment. <coughs> and uh, before taking a flight, uh, do you take any oxygen with you, or are you, able, are you so gifted that you can breathe without oxygen? <laughs> well, no, but I... I did have a, a small amount of oxygen to get me out there, but uh, there was a utility vehicle left by my uh, former construction manager, who works for these people right now, but uh, he left a utility vehicle out there, and I knew it had plenty of oxygen. So I was just going to go out there, grab my equipment, bring it back, and uh, go to sleep. So as soon as you got out there, of course, you refilled your tanks. No, I didn't have any time to do that. Uh, the damn asteroid started moving on me. And uh, do you need power for your pack, or, or do you, you pedal? How do you get around? Well, no, yeah, the, my uh, suit had some power on it, uh, but I knew I had an extra power pack in that utility vehicle. As soon as I got it, I'd have no problem with power. So as soon as the asteroid started moving, of course, you, you refilled your power pack? No, no, as I, uh, as I said, uh, as soon as that damn thing started moving, I. Uh, I analyzed the situation and uh, thought it was the best thing to go over to the, the dome and uh, stabilize the whole thing. I didn't have time to repower anything or reoxygenate anything. Okay. And uh, why did you pick that hour of the evening uh, to go out there if those aren't the normal working hours? Well, it was just, uh, shall we say, uh, quiet. Uh, may I suggest to you, sir, that uh, it was quiet and uh, who owned uh, the, the dome that you went into. Those guys did. Uh, and uh, uh, you're sorry that you didn't get the contract. I should have got the damn contract. Uh, isn't it true that you were jealous of uh, Barbara Griffith and Dwight Mack because of their company's success in winning the bid for Island 2 construction? No. Isn't it true that you traveled out to the residential facility 100 with a specific purpose and intent to sabotage the attitude control system? No. Nope. Isn't it true that you wanted to discredit Barbara Griffith and Dwight Mack personally and to ruin their company as they ruined yours? No, absolutely not. Uh, we got the con uh, contract on that uh, asteroid uh, as an example. Uh, we would have named it something good instead of RF-100. I would have named it to uh, maybe Bruno Land or something. <laughs> I, I can certainly understand that you would <laughs> Now, let me understand uh, that uh, you didn't file a flight plan. Yeah. Uh, you went out there when you believed no one would be there. Yeah. Uh, and you indicate that you had an entirely innocent purpose of doing this. Damn right. Uh, you indicate you feel there's some bad blood between uh, the defendants and yourself. No, no, I wouldn't say bad blood. Uh, we're healthy competitors. So you don't think they had anything against you personally? I don't think they liked me. Uh, but they liked you well enough to hire you as a subcontractor, is that correct? Yeah, they gave me some uh, piecemeal work on this construction, but I think that's because I'm a damn good builder. And uh, you feel if they hated you, they still would have given you those subcontracts? Well, I don't know. Uh, I think it's because I'm a damn good builder. I would have, I would have found some work for them, too. No further questions, Your Honor. Read the record. Uh, no, the defense can. Yeah. Uh, sorry. But, but if the court will agree, we'll do this uh, as we go along here. Uh, uh, we'll share the questions. If that's all right. Objection, Your Honor. I think they're double. <laughs> I would think with this witness, double teaming is the least you could do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if you saw someone, uh, Mr. Bruno, on an asteroid or another thing in space, would you not, uh, and it requires fuel to get from point A to point B, would 
do you not assume that the person who was at point A would have sufficient fuel with them to go to point B? Yeah, I guess they would have sufficient fuel if they went someplace and decided to go back. So it's a logical assumption if you saw someone and uh, put them out in a, in a, into a place where you had to go to point B that you'd have the fuel to go there. Yeah, I guess uh, you would have the fuel to go there. Uh, but, but I was looking at the list, but, but is it not the, true that you were debarred and suspended from government contracting back many years ago for violations of the Buy American Act? Well, uh, we had a little uh, problem there, and uh, we're under suspension right now, but uh, I hope to get that cured uh, pretty quickly. Uh, yes, would you tell me what the violation was? Would you tell the court what the violation was? Well, just some, uh, some inconsistencies that uh, I can't quite remember at the moment. <laughs> May I ask you, have you ever uh, changed the name of your company from time to time? It's, uh, it's uh, changed its name for uh, better advertising purposes. Uh, I see, yes. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Redirect, just briefly, Your Honor. When you were shot out into space from the airlock, why couldn't you get back to the asteroid? Well, Objection, Your Honor. I believe that's beyond the scope of the uh, cross-examination. Well, the, the, uh, in the court, the, uh, the cross went into the, the question of power and power packs, and the, uh, the people want to establish uh, that the power issue is not an issue at all. Objection number wrong. All I, all I know is that things happen very quickly. Both those defendants there tried, I think, to kill me and put me in that airlock and shoot me out into outer space. I was alone. I tried to communicate, but that didn't work. I knew I had limited air. When I got back and was finally rescued, I noticed part of my thruster pack was torn. I know I didn't do it. I wouldn't kill myself. They must have done it. No further questions, Joe. <coughs> Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Bruno. You may step down. Will the prosecution call another witness? People call Fred Briggs. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Mr. Briggs, would you state your name for the record, please? My name is Fred Briggs. And what's your position, sir? Um, I'm currently uh, vice president of a small subcontracting firm known as Oasis Electric. And what was your former position? Uh, I used to be a construction superintendent for Orbitech Construction. Of course. Is Orbitech Construction the construction firm of the defendants? Yes, that's true. And do you know the defendants? Yes, I do. Would you, would you point them out and call them by name, please? Barbara Griffith and White Mack. You were previously employed by Overtech? That's correct. And was, what years were that? It was um, 2026 through uh, June of 2030. Have you uh, had contact with the defendants since the year 2035 years ago? Uh, yes. Um, the reason I left their company was that uh, we finished construction of the of Island 2 <coughs> Space Settlement. And um, they didn't have any more contracts at the time. And so they laid me off. Um, but it was a friendly separation. And so at that time, I formed my new company and with people that I have worked with uh, a great deal. Have you had social contact with the defendants since the year 2030? Yes. As a matter of fact, they subsequently employed our company as a subcontractor uh, on the LaGrange Land development. When was the most recent time that you socialized with the defendants? Well, since I've been subcontracting with them, I haven't really socialized with them. I would say that 
the last time we really socialized was probably right around the time I had been laid off. And uh, we, we went down to the moon, down to the Luna Pleasure Domes, which is a resort down there. And um, uh, we were just kind of celebrating the completion of the space that one. So I, as I remember, uh, in fact, I do remember very specifically uh, that we went down there and we were celebrating together. Do you recall what you talked about then? Well, we talked about a lot of things. Mostly it was just, as with any project, or when you're, when you're almost finished with the project, there's a lot of little items that have to be taken care of. So we were talking about punch list items, and mostly business, I guess. Did Peter Bruno's name come up in the conversations? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, it did. Can you tell me what was said? Well, I don't remember what was said specifically, but they were making. Your Honor, can I object? This is hearsay. Your Honor, Counsel, given, given the facts of this case, I'm going to allow it in. And for now, we'll treat it as going to the weight rather than the admissibility of the evidence. And the, uh, the people would state, Your Honor, that uh, we're attempting to show state of mind at the time uh, of the alleged uh, incident on board uh, the dome. couple with Peter Bruno by the two defendants and uh, uh, we we're trying to show the state of mind and solve the case for a non support Thank you, Counsel. Do you want to continue? What, uh, was, what, what was said about Peter Bruno? I, I, I don't remember specifically, but I know it was derogatory and, and uh, I guess I'll continue. What happened is that they were they, they, they said something derogatory about Peter Bruno, and he was sitting at a table, you know, maybe two or three tables over, and he overheard them. And so he came over to our table, and he made a big scene, and um, they just, they got in a big argument. Did White Mac present with Peter Bruno at that time? What did he say? I can't remember the words, but... Basically, he said he was going to destroy his company. He said, I'm going to destroy you and your company. The people have no further questions. Uh, yes. Uh, excuse me. You said you were at the Luna. What was the name of that bar you were drinking at? Well, it's a big resort called the Luna Pleasure Dome, but as a matter of fact, we were at the bar at the time. And you were celebrating. That's correct. Yes. yes. Uh, and you know the. Uh, the, the, the space effects on the, 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 the alcohol consumption. Uh, yes, I've had quite a bit of experience. Yeah. With that. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're aware that your recollections of what was being said that evening, hearsay though they may be, uh, uh, are, are possibly muddled by the space effects? I'm going to just strike, Your Honor. I object to that statement. Um, I believe that the council is uh, getting into your progress. Uh, I, Counsel, I have to overrule your objection. I think it goes to the credibility of the witness. Oh, uh, yes. All right. So you were drinking for a long time. Can you count how many I drinks? I know. As a matter of fact, we hadn't been drinking for a long time. I think that I had two, maybe three drinks. I would say two. That's my recollection. Uh, that's not very much uh, celebrating, is it? Uh, I think you said it was a celebration. Uh, well, it was, but I, I'm saying that the incident occurred rather early in the evening. Later on, you can still recall what happened. All right. Uh, but uh, what, uh, I was looking, and I wonder if you would tell the court uh, of your previous experiences on alcoholic problems with the law. Uh, I never, Your Honor, this is not relevant. Well, Your Honor, I believe it goes to the credibility of the testimony. Counsel, could you make us a specific offer? Uh, uh, yes. How many times have you been arrested for inebriation? I've never but, been arrested for space. I see. Uh, uh, okay, one other point. Now, you're in the business uh, of working with space contractors. That's correct. Uh, and uh, Mr. Bruno is in the business of being a space contractor. That's correct. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, but I gather, I, uh, I assume you are bidding on his new project, are you? 
Uh, I don't know what project that would be. I see. Well, you have no bids in on projects of <coughs> Mr. Bruno's, but if he comes up with one, you will bid for it. Well, his company, Shark has been able to do that. I believe you're right. Far field from the uh, issue for this court. Counsel, I do think we'll bear being close. I'll allow this question on the theory that it still goes to credibility. Yes, would you answer that? Number? It's a hard question to answer. His company is a lot smaller than it used to be. Um, whether he would have, whether he would ever win a prime contract large enough for us to bid on, it's hard to say. But if he did, uh, you might bid and you would be awarded the contract if you were good graces with Mr. Bruno. And if I had the most bid, yes. Yes, of course. That's all. Right. That's all. They'll redirect your honor. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gregg. You may step down. Prosecution has another witness. People call Joseph Gallagher.
Well, there was some conflict. resentment in the community to the uh, to the defendant's uh, business and commercial interests uh, with respect to uh, the established base. Uh, well, there was there was conflict on that because on the other yes, there was because that wasn't something that we wanted that close to the settlement. On the other hand, the people who were going to live there were people who worked on the island too, and there it was hard to tell them no. Um, so even though there was this controversy, the council eventually uh, voted to proceed. So in light of the possibility of collision, were there steps taken to try to make sure that wouldn't occur? Well, we wanted to have some kind of uh, legal sanction, some kind of force to motivate it not to occur rather than just count on their, uh, their good graces. Uh, which raised the whole issue of, of how do we defend ourselves and our property. And we, uh, we decided what we really needed was some kind of system of property rights for them, similar to what we have in Island 2, which is uh, very much like a uh, condo that you folks have on Earth, where you own the airspace, but uh, you buy the services from, uh, from essentially the, uh, the owners association. And is that the system that was implemented by the council? It was initially, yes, sir. And then what? Well, we had a little problem. The uh, uh, super high-tech hardware and software that was touted as uh, being foolproof almost crashed a big piece of hardware into our settlement. It was a close approach and uh, made a lot of people on the council nervous. Basically, we felt we'd been, uh, the safety issue had been misrepresented. And we're seriously reconsidering uh, the whole property rights that we had granted them on that basis. Whether or not we even want the thing within, uh, within our safety zone. You, there are a lot of people nervous out here now. Are you familiar with the events of February 5th, <clears throat> 2035, in which the residential unit uh, came uh, too close for comfort to the island base? Yes, sir. Objection, Your Honor, leading. <clears throat> yes, sir. That's the incident to which I'm referring. As a result of the incident, uh, was the property rights ordinance, was there action on the property rights ordinance? It was repealed. No further questions. <coughs> Depends on your honor. Are there any no further questions? You may step down, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you. And let's see, prosecutors have another witness. The people call Donald Trump. Very good. <laughs> 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 
Uh, okay, well then I would raise to the court's attention the fact that uh, a master's in law in Canada uh, is not necessarily relevant or would make the, uh, the, the, the uh, Mr. Koenig an expert uh, on American law and our, our, our defendants are being tried under American law in an American court. So I question his expertise on that point. Does the prosecution have any questions? <clears throat> Just to uh, going to the defense point of a uh, mere academic degree, I would just ask the witness how long he's practiced space law and in what country. I practiced space law for 15 years here in California. I'm a member of the California Bar. I'm a member of the Committee of Bar Examiners. And uh, I would also add that at McGill, they teach you a generic type of space law. We, we did not learn Canadian law at McGill. Thank you, counsel. Uh, may I continue on this? Uh, Please. Since you've raised it, yeah. uh, would you tell me what space law is, please? Well, that definition goes back to the early 50s. Um, there are various types of space law. There's international space law, which is geared toward treaty. There's master law, which deals with the day-to-day -day affairs of space bearers, including outer space. There's commercial space law. So I guess you'd have to further define that question. Uh, yes, well, okay, what is the space law that's applicable to this particular criminal trial? This is a criminal trial in American court, and I, well, space law is interesting, and I think we're all versed in it to some extent here. Uh, I question its relevance to a criminal trial in this country. Well, I see three issues. There's the jurisdictional issue, there's the degree of the crime, in other words, the crime committed in outer space more serious than the same crime committed on Earth. And, of course, there's a property rights question, too. So of course, the court is well aware of what the uh, law is. I'm, I'm sure they're glad to be instructed by it, but I think they can probably figure what uh, Well, without insulting the court, I, I understand that a, a judge cannot be an expert in all fields of the law. They're interested in moving the case along, and uh, if they were indeed experts, uh, then I probably wouldn't be here. But, uh, well, uh, uh, it's interesting. It's hard to part of me. jurisdiction 
with respect to space, would you say that time has come yet? Well, given the fact that space is an exceedingly hostile and dangerous environment, um, I think criminal laws take on an especially important role in outer space. Um, it doesn't make a difference whether we talk about space law or history. Criminal laws are an act to uh, govern society's behavior. And I think in space, it's no different. Uh, it's a, it's a serious business out there. With respect to the settlements that we currently have and those in the foreseeable future, would it be realistic to, to assume that those settlements could maintain their own criminal justice system? Well, that's more uh, science fiction than science fact. I think we may see that at some point in the future. For the time being, we need some pretty clear-cut laws. <laughs> Are there crimes which have more severe penalties because of policy uh, reasons related to the outer space environment? Well, I think that's definitely the case. Um, one example that comes to mind would be carrying a loaded firearm for a spacecraft. Uh, if that weapon were to accidentally discharge, the results would be catastrophic. I mean, you can compare it to uh, carrying a loaded firearm aboard an aircraft. At least on an aircraft, you may have a chance to dive down to a lower altitude and get some air and pressure back into the, the cabin. If that same weapon goes off on the Planet of service, depending on where it's pointed, may be no big deal. You don't have an entire colony dying. What about uh, sending someone out of an airlock with no means of rescue? Would you, would you say that was attempted murder under the criminal law as it stands today? Well, I think it's another good example. If uh, you push someone out there, we all know the laws of physics and what's out there. And what's out there isn't very much. So uh, pushing someone out of an airlock. <coughs> I think all that category, but it's especially serious. No further questions. Uh, Mr. Koenig, uh, by the way, what does Koenig mean? Uh, it means a king. It means true. king, I see. And you indicated earlier that you believe that your opinions uh, certainly ought to supersede those and uh, be accepted <laughs> by the court. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And uh, can you tell me what the IISL is? International Institute of Space Law. And uh, you're a member of that body? Uh, I have been since, well, many years. I see. Uh, and uh, are you familiar with George Robinson? Yes. And uh, has he done any work in this particular area? Well, George is pretty well known for writing about uh, the, uh, the biological connection to uh, space law. He sees a humankind evolving where people have different standards, uh, have a different uh, standard of what's reasonable behavior and so forth. Uh, you would indicate uh, then that uh, George Robinson might hold a view that uh, spacefarers ought to be able to uh, write their own rules, so to speak, because of the particular pressures that were upon them. Well, assuming he believes what he writes, yes. And you would disagree with that view? No, it's just a matter of time. Uh, that may eventually occur. We, we just haven't reached that time yet. Uh, you said that there's no question, but in your opinion, and in this case, there's jurisdiction. Uh, are you predicating that upon 18 U.S. Code Section 6 or Section 7? 7. Why? Uh, do you believe it's clear under Section 6? I believe it is not clear under Section 6. Uh, why would that be your view? Section 6 only applies from the time you launch a people on space until the time it's Turn to the service. In other words, it only applies to what goes on inside the spacecraft. We're not coming back. I see. And uh, there's no spacecraft involved here. Well, that's a definitional problem. There's a, a habitat built upon a, an asteroid. Uh, is that a spacecraft uh, uh, owned by the United States? Well, or under, or under the jurisdiction of the United States? I can see it's probably not a spacecraft as the original uh, drafters of that statute. Uh, now, Section 7 you referred to uh, applies, uh, as you said, wherever uh, U.S. citizens are involved. That's correct. Uh, would you accept that that was part of the uh, terrorist uh, legislation that was passed in the United States uh, back in the 1980s? That's correct. That statute was not written specifically for use in space. I see. So, uh, you feel that that statute then ought to apply to terrorist activity? Certainly. I see. Uh, but not only terrorist activity. Uh, what leads you to believe that it ought to apply to something besides that? Is it in the statute? I just read the clear wording of the statute. It's just like you with the CMJ Article 5. It applies in all places. All places, the means everywhere. I see. Uh, 
then wherever it is in the universe, uh, regardless of what's happening there, it ought to apply. That's what the statute says, yes, sir. Uh, you don't believe that there is a doctrine that you ought to take the circumstances under which the statute was written and apply it then to those circumstances. If the statute is ambiguous, I believe that would be the case. Uh, no, the statute's clear, but it is aimed at certain purposes because of the legislative intent which occurred at that point in time. You don't think the legislative intent is of any significance then as to uh, the applicability? I believe if the statute is clear, you follow the statute and legislative intent is not important. I see. There no further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. No redirect, Your Honor. The defense rests. Or the people rest. The <laughs> defense <laughs> never rests, Your Honor. <laughs> but before we do so, let me identify who the witnesses for the prosecution were there and identify by name other than their true name. The first witness uh, playing the role of Peter Bruno was Chuck Stovich. The individual playing the role of Fred Briggs was Wayne White. Joe Gallagher was played by Terry Savage. And John Kinney, Scott March. The prosecution having rested and is now at about uh, 10 minutes after the hour. We're going to take a recess of 10 minutes. We can also be prepared to resume in 10 minutes. Yes, Your Honor. Well, 
You see, in a station keeping program, there's also a backup diagnostic program, which evaluates the orbital um, mechanical propulsion systems and also looks at the introduction of the computer as a whole. Now, what seemed to have happened is that there was a programming error, either a programming error, either it had occurred in a mistake in the original programming, or there was an error in the transmission of the data between the systems, or there was a deliberate intervention of a human being. I see. And now we have here, uh, in the courtroom, um, a facility for demonstrating some of what you're saying. Would you yes, show the court control and the jury here? Yes. That's the space traffic control computer. We uh, refer to it as Stacy. Um, Stacy will be. Pardon me, can you all see this on the jury? Can you? Okay. Stacy will be able to show you a video display to illustrate the probable path of the residential facility on the basis of its initial trajectory. I believe that should be the first image. After established our communication. Yes. What, what uh, the intent here is for this graphic we'll show you is the predicted trajectory and the area of its probable intersection with the settlement living area. And if you would explain as you go along for those who don't have a good view of that, we appreciate it. Uh, this is my technical assistant, and he is competent in giving you further details on Stacy's operations. So, I've worked with this man for many years, and he's been a student of mine for at least 22 years. <laughs> We're looking for a video display to illustrate the probable path of the residential facility on the basis of its initial trajectory. How many years? Yes, and if you'll explain, okay, lucidly as you go along, because many of the jury uh, are, are un, unsophisticated, many of us are, I should say. Well, in the development of computer programs, uh, programs, as well as in backup programs, uh, as you know, computers do not make mistakes. Uh, maybe they did in the late 20th century. In the 21st century, they do not make mistakes. And what you will see here is you will see Stacy looking at the orbital positioning of the RF-100, that's the residential facility, and at the same time of the settlement. You'll also see the likelihood of contact being made if it was able to continue in its original projector. Stacy's busy right now. Uh, Stacy must be communicating with another traffic controller at this right. moment. I'm sorry, but this uh, should yeah. be only a temporary delay. That's quite understandable, but while, while Stacy is catching up, perhaps you can uh, give us a little elaboration on where it's going to take us. Well, it should actually show you that there is about a 60% probability that um, the RF-100 could have struck Island 2. Um, Stacy has shown on the computer that... Um, I'm sorry, would you say again what the probability was? Approximately 60%. That's very high probability. I think Stacy might even evaluate it as slightly higher, but in my recent judgment, I would say 60%. This will uh, totally probably be that. 53% is what it is. 53% is what is reading on the screen, is that right? Yes. As I've said, Stacy would. And you can see the trajectory in orbit, and you will be able to have close graphics representation of its position. Would you like to say it again? Come around in the path of the trajectory, if you would, please. Find the court is the number five. Yes. Okay, now, um, based on your experience, would you consider that to be a dangerously high probability or possibility? Well, most definitely. Most definitely? Most definitely. But anything more than 1% would be a danger, I presume. Generally so. 2% is allowable. 1% is considered to be a limitation. Well, have you ever seen or heard of anything in a 53% range before that would? No. No. That's extremely high by your experience? Yes. All right, so then, uh, is there something you can add on the program? No, there's nothing else. You can just uh, determine what the highest probability is based on the available data. All right, and so 53% probability, a very high and very dangerous number. Yes. All right, that's all.
May I have the co-counsel explain this, please? Thank you. Uh, one further question. Uh, I think you're generally familiar with the facts in this case. Uh, if you were on this asteroid at the time that it began uh, this movement, uh, in your opinion, uh, would you have anticipated uh, a, a collision possibility of significant magnitude? Oh, most definitely. It would be a, a life-threatening situation. And people on the asteroid would have realized that uh, quickly. Well, they should have. You see, the puzzling thing, of course, is that a um, diagnostic program should have caught this. And uh, typically, a diagnostic program evaluates the station keeping program. And when it's implemented, that program is run to check the system to ensure that it is operating at 100% efficiency. Um, it seems to me that that program must have been run. Or if, in fact, it was not run, then an error could have occurred in the system activation procedures. No further questions, Your Honor. Prosecution has no questions for this or his assistant. Thank you, Mr. Senator. You may step down. The defense will call another witness, I believe. At this time, Your Honor, would call uh, uh, one of the defendants, uh, Barbara Griffin. Sorry, I'd like to make a motion here uh, about this computer. Uh, I would like to have this computer terminated for the purpose of uh, this testimony so that this computer can testify again uh, about something else that happened. I would like to have its ears closed. Or, uh, this witness is allowed to testify. Counsel, what's the basis of the motion? The basis is that this computer uh, is uh, a witness in this action, and uh, is, as such, uh, I believe, uh, should be excluded from uh, continuing to analyze uh, what's transpiring here. Do you have any legal authority to support that conclusion? As a matter of fact, I do, but I left it in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs>
around behind the figure. I saw before I really came all the way around that his lips were moving inside the helmet. He was obviously conversing with the computer. Um, <clears throat> when he did turn around, I saw the name on the helmet was Bruno. And uh, right then, we had our suspicions that something was really wrong. Uh, Mac ran over the consoles to see what actually had been done, began frantically running back and forth to see if uh, what actually happened, checked everything out, and said, the thrusters are firing, and we're heading for Nail City for the colony. Don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to ask you, uh, did you feel the thrusters firing at that point in time? Uh, it was evident that something was going on. It, it felt as though something uh, were happening there. And when was the first time that you felt that movement? Uh, I would say that that was while we were getting dressed and heading down to the window. It was after then you had observed an individual entering through the space lock. That is correct. Continue, please. Uh, at this point, uh, we knew we had to do something quick. We were on a collision course. It was dangerous here. Uh, our, our main thoughts were, were for the safety of the, the colony, the safety of our facility that we had just completed, and our own lives. So we knew we had to get Bruno out of there so that we, could, uh, we couldn't deal with him at that point. So Mac and I grabbed him and uh, uh, shoved him into the airlock. Got it closed down. As soon as it was shut down, we hit the button and um, sent him out the airlock. Why, did, why did you do that? Uh, we couldn't deal with him right then. We needed to get him out of there. We had only a short time to correct this problem before it would be too late and uh, there would be a collision and a probable loss of life. Was there any reason for uh, hitting the airlock button immediately? Uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, we, were, um, we were acting instinctively, I believe, at this point, and we just needed to act quickly so that we could get back to the program and address the problem. Uh, in your professional judgment, how much time did you have uh, before the out of position condition of the asteroid might affect the column? Uh, it was just a matter of minutes. I mean, it, I, I can't tell you exactly, um, but it was, it was a matter of minutes there. All right, after this occurred, uh, what uh, did you and your husband then do with regard to stabilizing the asteroid? Uh, immediately we went to work on the program to see if we could correct it and uh, we were working several minutes there when we intercepted some sort of a communication from traffic control. Uh, they were calling a utility vehicle nearby and they obviously had to determine what our problem was We're sending the utility vehicle up. We contacted that same uh, utility vehicle and told them to immediately go to thruster 3 and manually shut it down. In this way, our trajectory would be changed and the collision could be avoided. We would have time to work with the station keeping program. And um, <clears throat> so uh, they were able to do that. In the meantime, while we worked on the program, uh, we realized that there were uh, significant problems with the station keeping program and we wouldn't be able to use it. So we got a fresh copy from uh, the library on the colony and uh, loaded that in. And actually, at that point, the station keeping program worked great. I mean, this is the first real test, and I want to say that it it went really well, we had no problems. The new copy of the uh, uh, station keeping program that uh, came up was uh, an exact duplicate of the original? Uh, the one yes, that was it was installed? Yes, to our, it was. And uh, in checking it out, there were no difficulties that were found with the uh, new program, the new copy that came up? Uh, no, it functioned perfectly. Uh, there was no indication that uh, the program had any sort of errors or problems in it. Your witness, Counselor. Ms. Griffith, uh, were you aware that the new space traffic control computer was operating at this time? Uh, no, I was not aware of that. Can you describe instances uh, in which you may have been led to believe that Mr. Bruno was not trustworthy? Uh, yes, there were several instances actually uh, when we were competing for the same contracts and he came in with uh, bids just under our bids and I believe that he obtained that information inside sources in an unethical manner. Would it be fair to say that you had some dislike for Mr. Bruno based upon this? Oh, I don't think dislike is a proper term. We were competitors, certainly. Uh, it's business. When you saw Bruno on the helmet, you knew it was Peter Bruno? 
Uh, yes. Did you see his face? Uh, yes, I did see his face from the side initially. Um, I saw his lips moving. Did you clearly recognize him as Peter Bruno? Uh, it was somewhat dark, but it was a fair, uh, I would say that it was definitely Peter Bruno. Did you consider any alternatives before you pushed Peter Bruno out into the airlock? Uh, no, not really. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time, and uh, we were really acting instinctively at that point. Whose hand pushed the button to open the airlock? Uh, both Max and mine were on that button at the same time. Did you know that he would probably die when you put him out the airlock? Uh, no, no, I, he was in a suit and uh, there was no reason to believe that that would happen. Isn't it true that you deliberately tore the fuel line off his suit? Uh, that is absolutely not true. But you did know it was Peter Bruno. Yes. Did you know that the fuel line on the thruster pack was broken? Uh, no. Isn't it true that you really did intend to kill Peter Bruno when you took these actions? Absolutely not. Did you ever intend to hurt Peter Bruno? No, we had no intention to hurt him at all. We were really just thinking about the safety of the facility at that time. No further questions. Uh, there's a previous testimony. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's no bad blood between, in particular between you and Peter Bruno, is there? No, no, I wouldn't say there's, we're competitors. And, uh, and as a point of fact, uh, you've even given him some contracts with regard to these projects, I think. That's true. That's true. We're happy to uh, have him participate in our project. No further questions. No, no reprocession. The court has one question for us. Can you tell us whether it's possible to have left somebody in the airlock without actually selling them into space? Uh, at that point, it seemed like the most reasonable thing to do. It, it seemed to us we had a saboteur on board, and to have left him where he could have access to the, the facility again would have been dangerous, and we couldn't deal with it at that point. But was it physically possible to lock that person in the airlock without expelling him into space? Uh, I don't believe it was possible to actually lock him in the airlock. There's easy access at this point because we have to have workers coming in and out of the facility. And it was still under construction. As I said, it, we just finished and we were just cleaning it up. So it's, there's not really a way to lock people in and out at this point. And there was no lock? No, there was no lock. Thank you. The question was, excuse me, John. I stepped down on the next press witness. Uh, the defense, uh, Your Honor, recalls the next witness, the other defendant. White Mac. Mac, do you remember an incident at 
question? No. Uh, all right, I guess we're finished with you as a witness, uh, Mr. Mack. Uh, <coughs> next witness, please. Uh, the defense will call as its next witness uh, Stacy, the space traffic control computer. Uh, may it please the court. Intelligence exceeds human intelligence, but she is only programmed 
perform traffic scheduling and control emergencies and dispatching tasks. Although composed of multiple computer facilities, Stacy's functions as a single entity and presents a uniform personality and appearance on screen throughout the Earth Moon system. In essence, Your Honor, uh, if the court please, this is a system uh, which has been hired by governments to provide a very critical uh, station keeping and traffic control analysis. And unless the prosecution wishes to challenge the ability of government to provide such a system, I would suggest that its authenticity is established by its creation. But counsel, I take it you're still not able to tell me whether the person who programmed this machine tells the truth. The prosecution is in the best position, Your Honor, to state whether government employees lie. <laughs> counsel, for now, we will allow you to proceed. <laughs> Reserve you the right of the prosecution to make a motion to strike. Well, the people will make that motion right now with the court's indulgence. Uh, I believe that uh, Your Honor was referring to several sections of the Federal Rules of Evidence, uh, specifically Section 106, which talks about a recorded statement. Uh, and there's no question that uh, uh, things that computers may have in them and evidence that computers may have in them may be admitted, but not as testimony. Testimony uh, involves a human element. It involves being able to distinguish right from wrong, and that's uh, Section 603 that uh, a computer is unable to take an oath to say that it will, that it will uh, be able to distinguish right from wrong. Uh, the other objections that we would have to the, quote, testimony of this, quote, witness, unquote, is that uh, Section 801 talks about hearsay, which is also a point that uh, the court brought up. The, uh, even if this testimony were admissible, uh, even if we assume that under Section 601 that the computer was a person within the scope of the federal rules of evidence, and even if we assume that it had personal knowledge within Section 602 of the federal rules of evidence, uh, this testimony, if you can call it that, would not be admissible because it lacks foundation and authentication as the court as well. Too. So we renew our objections on all those grounds. Counsel, at the present time, I'm going to deny your objection, but we'll afford you the opportunity to renew your motion later. If at that time the testimony is stricken and admonition will be given to the juror to disregard what they've heard, and I'm confident that they can do that. For the record, would you please state your name? I am known as the Space Traffic Control Computer, acronym STC. In my communications with humans, I am commonly addressed as Stacy. <laughs> uh, Stacy, my name is Mr. Word, and I would like to ask you some questions about an incident which occurred on February 5, 2035, in the vicinity of the space settlement known as Island 2. Before I ask you these questions, I would like for you to describe to the court the characteristics of your hardware and software design and the services which you were designed to perform. I am a computer network comprised of nine computers in the following locations. Low Earth Orbit at Space Station's Freedom and Commerce Lab 1, on the moon at Luna City Station and Farside Observatory, in lunar orbit at mass capture stations 1, 2, and 3, and at space station settlement facilities Island 1 and Island 2 at the Rangian points L5 and L3.
Webster's 15th New Collegiate Dictionary, and the 2034 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Stacy, would you please tell the court when your computer facility at Island 2 began operating? That facility began operating at 0834 on February 4, 2035, for the purpose of systems tests. Would you please describe for us the nature of these system tests? After the node was activated, a series of diagnostic programs were run to confirm that the operating system was fully functioning. At 1200 hours on February 4, communication software installation was complete and the operating system began communicating with the network. Continue, please. At 12.37, the facility mass capture 2 began transmitting the remaining space traffic control and emergency services programs and the data necessary for these programs to operate. Technicians at Island 2 then installed diagnostic programming and began evaluating the traffic control and emergency services programs. The diagnostic programs ran until 21.30 on February 4. Did you begin directing traffic after the system tests were complete? No. At 09.30 on February 5, I began operating in tandem with the existing human operations control center at Island 2. I did not actually communicate with any traffic or receive emergency services requests, but my responses to the communications received at the Human Operations Center were recorded for analysis and comparison. I continued tandem operations through the night cycle. The Human Operations Control Center ceased operations at 0800 hours on February 6, at which time I assumed all of my regular duties. During the course of your tandem operation, did any unusual events occur? Yes. On February 5, my sensors detected unusual activity inside the safety zone of Island 2. An unidentified object with no recorded flight plan left the vehicle staging area at 2339. as to what that object was. Because of the object's size and velocity, there was a 95% probability that the object was a human being in a spacesuit using a thruster pack for propulsion. Do you know whether or not the human controllers sensed this object? Monitored communications from the Space Traffic Control Center indicated that the human controllers have not recognized this activity as out of the ordinary. And why was this activity? The object's trajectory indicated that it was proceeding towards the construction area known as LaGrange Land. <laughs> construction activity was scheduled at LaGrange Land from 0730 through 1700 on the days Monday through Saturday. On any day of the week, activity at the range land would have been abnormal after 1,700 hours. Please describe the activity of this object after it left the staging area. The object continued out to space object RF-100. The RF designation indicates that the destination object was a residential facility.
the residential facility began moving.
briefly, an object left at 23.39 hours and after a 17 minute flight landed on the asteroid at 23.56. The first movement was detected 23 minutes later at 0019. You then detected that the object left the asteroid some 10 minutes later at 0029 and the asteroid was not stable <coughs> until 30 minutes thereafter at 0059. Is there anything more that you feel that I ought to add? <coughs> no. <laughs>
called the Golden Bear, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, uh, then I will ask you, if I may, uh, how decisions are normally made by groups who are confined in close quarters in a hostile environment. Okay, the group dynamics in a situation like that are very similar to those uh, in a tribal organization where a small group is totally dependent on the cooperation of the entire group for its survival. And when you have a situation where one person acts against the group, uh, you are endangering the entire group and the group will react. <coughs> and uh, this kind of gets back to an old adage that was stated by a very well-known friend of ours, that the uh, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few are the ones. <laughs> <laughs>
sum up for the jury what this case is all about. And there are some provocative issues here. As I suggested to you in my opening remarks, the jurisdictional issue is an interesting question. When will space settlements take upon themselves their own form of government, including the criminal laws? It's an interesting question, somewhat academic. We are not there yet. This court clearly has jurisdiction, as you've heard the space law expert testify. And Congress has envisioned that we are not there yet, and the courts will be in a position now to agree. This court has agreed. And if the jurisdictional issue is an issue that is fatal to the case, it is not an issue which the jury has the right to decide. It is an issue which would be decided by judges in accordance with the law on appeal. So don't be thrown aside by that issue. Let's be focused on the fact that this is a plain attempted murder case which happened to occur in space. Another provocative issue is whether a computer is a person within the law so that it can testify. And you had us make, you heard many objections today by the prosecution to the format in which a computer was able to testify in this courtroom today. The simple fact is that most of that evidence in one form or another is relevant to the case and probably would be admitted if it was just the form in which it was presented that was a new issue for the law to deal with. At some point, they may be accepted as, computers may be accepted as persons within the law, at least for testimonial purposes. But for now, that's another issue for the future. What Stacy had to say was relevant, and we'll talk about that again in a minute. Focus in on the fact that this is a plain and simple attempted murder case. Fred Briggs had testified that there was a threat to kill Peter Bruno made by the defendant, Dwight Mack. He wanted to destroy Peter Bruno and Peter Bruno's car. Whenever we discuss crimes in law, we typically revert back to an acronym called Bond, Motive, Opportunity, and Need. And what we have to show in our burden as the people in prosecuting this case is that all the elements of the offense were met. We'll go through those as we proceed. But the motive here was this past relationship, this hatred that the defendants had for Peter Bruno. And the opportunity was presented quite without their planning when RF-100 was entered by Peter Bruno in his attempt to stop the asteroid from its trajectory in its path to impact, as Stacy has testified, a 53% chance to impact the colony. So they had the opportunity presented to them as sort of a gift to finally get even with Peter Bruno after all these years of frustrating being at bid on contracts and frustrating business relations between them and altercations in places like the bar. We'll talk about attempted murder, but as I told you in the beginning, murder is the unlawful killing of another human being with malice of forethought without justification or defense. Now let's break that down into a couple of things quickly. Unlawful killing. Were they attempting to kill him? Stacy testified that Barbara Griffith knew or did not know. No, that's not correct. Excuse me. Barbara Griffith testified that she did not know that Stacy was operating at that time. And Stacy testified that only Stacy probably would have picked up the fact that a human had been ejected from the RF-100 facility. In other words, if Barbara had known that Stacy were operating and were able to pick up Peter being ejected out of the craft, then she would not have necessarily taken the action she did. Because she knew that Stacy was operating at that time. Now, 
because she knew she would have been protected by Stacy. We've got the, the motive, the past business dealings, the fights, we've got the opportunity when he uh, entered the facility to try to stop it from impacting the, uh, the settlement. And the means, there were the two of them, they, they scuffled with him and they attempted to kill him by pushing him into the airlock and then injecting him into space. There's conflicting testimony about the tear in the spacesuit. And you will have to believe to, to convict the defendants of attempted murder that they would have either known that they're putting him out into space would have been likely to end his death. Uh, and that issue of the torn uh, fuel line goes to that. If it was torn in the scuffle and they didn't intend that that was the case, then perhaps they should be exonerated. If they intentionally did it in the scuffle, or if they saw that it was done in the scuffle and then ejected him into the airlock and out into outer space, then that would provide the basis for the intentional killing, the killing aspect of intent. Malice of forethought just means that they were able to formulate in their minds the, the plan, the plan to kill him, so that they didn't have to have a state of mind that they were going to kill him at any time prior to the actual act of the scuffle and pushing him out into the, to the airlock. Uh, they just had to have that state of mind prior to the scuffle or during the scuffle. It wasn't something they had to, to build up in them for some long time. It was something that could occur just prior to the actual acts that took place here. Because the criminal law requires combination of a guilty mind, if you will, along with the act that was the crime, uh, an element of the crime. So if you have those two, then you have the uh, intent to kill with malice of forethought. Let's just go to the third element of crime, is, and that is without justification or excuse. You've heard testimony here today that the, the, uh, they were trying to save the colony. Uh, Barbara Griffin testified, we had a saboteur on board. Interesting, she would use that phraseology. Uh, she knew darn well it was Peter Bruno. She testified to that effect. But relapsing into her defense, uh, you know, we had a saboteur on board and we were just trying to protect the colony and the station and get rid of them. Mac testified. If I'd wanted him dead, he'd be dead. And I think that that lapse on the stand was an indication of the true character and the true feelings of Mac for the defendant, or for the victim, Peter Bruno. Um, if it had not been for the action of Stacy in picking him up and sending out a rescue vehicle, then it would indeed be murder today instead of the attempted murder. The last defense is justification or excuse uh, with respect to the scuffle itself. And Gail Seymour, as an expert in human factors, testified that whenever you're talking about space in a very hostile environment, you do have a problem with this tribal uh, feelings and, and justifying the sacrificing one for the, uh, the benefit of the whole. And that probably does have some, some impact in space, but it's not relevant here. Uh, the reason it's not relevant here is because she testified that when you lit a match or lit up a lighter, light a cigarette, or in a hand grenade situation, that is a case in which it may be justified for the protection of the group to sacrifice the individual who is doing the, the wrong or idiotic act. That is not the case here. The reprogramming of the computer on board the RF-100 was not a hand grenade type event. It was not something that was going to, the impact was not going to occur instantaneously. There was plenty of time to turn RF-100 around or stop it in where it was. This was not the kind of thing where uh, it was required that the, uh, the victim be punched out into space with a torn space. It's very clear that based upon the past relations of the parties in the case, that there was an intent to kill here, and there was no justification for that.
that attempt at murder. Thank you very much for your time. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, the prosecution has said some very interesting thing in this, things in its closing argument, and I'd like to comment on them a couple of things. One, they said that uh, Bruno was presented to them as a gift. I would suggest to you that Bruno is no gift. <laughs> uh, and as I told you in my opening comments, uh, I think the prosecution is, uh, is secretly desirous of prosecuting a murder case rather than an attempted murder case. And I suspect there are those in the space community that would join them that would feel that <laughs> Bruno might have been better off uh, had he not survived. Well, I can't take any more of this. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> As my mother used to say, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> but let us get to the serious part of the case. The government must prove not one, not two, but all three of the elements of the crime of attempted murder. It's not sufficient, for instance, that you believe that the mode and the opportunity was there. There must also be the intent. And similarly, with the judge will instruct you with regard to the elements of the crime. The simple point that I'm making is that all three must be established by the government beyond a reasonable doubt. And the court will instruct you as to the meaning of the phrase beyond a reasonable doubt, and I'll not dwell upon it, because you should take the law from them and not from me nor from the prosecution. Let us talk for a moment about the torn suit. You remember that Bruno himself said he did not know when the suit was torn. If he did not know when it was torn, you heard the testimony of the two defendants that they did not know it was torn. And you, yet you find the prosecution having to establish that the suit must have been torn and must have been known by the two defendants or else there could be no intention to murder. I would suggest to you that the whole conduct of Bruno is highly suspect here. You have an individual leaving a safe place and going to an asteroid at a period of time when he thought there would be no one there because work would not be occurring at close to midnight in order to make sure that he could do something without being detected he did not file a flight plan clearly an indication by him and you can draw upon all the circumstances to determine how the computer quote malfunction occurred did it occur as a result of a program failure or because of human intervention? And I use the phrase human in quotes. <laughs> Is Bruno the one that caused the problem? You will note from the timeline that Bruno left at 2339 and arrived at 2356, some 17 minutes later. Movement did not occur for 23 minutes after his arrival at the asteroid. It is beyond the realm of reasonable calculation to assume that the computer program suddenly went wrong 23 minutes after Bruno had arrived. It is almost too coincidental, and I suggest to you that Bruno is not to believe, be believed in his denials that he was the one that caused the computer to vary from its established orbit. With regard to the emergency situation which the two defendants found themselves in, you will note that even after excluding Bruno from the station, that it took 30 minutes to stabilize the asteroid so there would no longer be a threat either to them or to the other space community. Simply stated, the prosecution has failed in its burden of proof. This is a serious matter. The prosecution has said it is a simple case of murder. I suggest to you that it is far more than that because the defendants are entitled to a jury of their peers. None of you having been in space, you must, however, accord them the right which they are due to assume yourself as spacefarers and to understand the circumstances under which they found themselves that night. In closing then, I would suggest that the only course of action open to you is to acquit them of the charge which they are presently charged with in the indictment. However, the defense would urge you to suggest that they remain incarcerated until 
Attorney's fees have been paid. Nothing further. Now we come to a very solemn moment in this uh, trial. We are going to hear the instruction to the jury. And this will be provided by Judge Nathan Colton, my wife. Members of the jury, now that you have heard the evidence and the argument, it becomes my duty to instruct you on the law applicable in this case. It is your duty as jurors to follow the law as stated in the instructions of the court and to apply the rule of law so given to the facts as you find them from the evidence in the case. It is charged in the indictment that on or about the 6th of February, 2035, the defendants attempted to murder Peter Bruno by forcibly ejecting him from the airlock of an outer space facility with full knowledge that Peter Bruno's death was the probable result of their act. If the facts are as alleged by the prosecution, the defendant's act contribute, uh, contributes a uh, violation of Title 18, Section 1113 of the U.S. Code. The essential disputed elements of the crime of attempted murder are as follows. The defendants must have taken a substantial step towards the completion of the act of killing another person unlawfully. Two, the defendants must have perpetrated said act with malice aforethought. And there must have been no justification or excuse under the law for the defendant's act. Malice of forethought means an intent at the time of the defendant's act to willfully take the life of a human being or an attempt to willfully act in callous and wanton disregard of the consequences of human life. Malice of forethought does not necessarily imply any ill will, spite, or hatred towards the individual against whom the act was perpetrated. Unless the government proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's have committed every element of the offense with which they are charged, you must find them not guilty. If you find that the defendants reasonably believed that their act was necessary to defend the occupants of Island 2 from an unlawful act, and if you find that the defendants used only that force which they reasonably believed to be necessary, the defendant act is justified, and you must find them not guilty. The defendants allege that they discovered Peter Bruno committing the crime of malicious mischief and that they acted to prevent the com completion of that crime. Title 18, Section 1363 of the U.S. Code establishes the elements of the felony offense of malicious mischief. Whoever within the special maritime and territorial jurisdiction of the United States willfully and maliciously destroys or injures or attempts to destroy or injure any building shall be fined not more than $1,000 or imprisoned for not more than five years or both. And if the building be a dwelling or the life of any person be placed in jeopardy, the fine shall be not more than 5000 or imprisonment not more than 20 years or both. If you find that the defendants committed their act to prevent the completion of the felony of malicious mischief, then also their act is justified and you must find them not guilty. If you find that the defendant's act was necessary as an emergency measure to avoid imminent private and public injury, which were not caused by the defendants, and secondly, if you find that the desirability of avoiding the injury clearly outweighed the uh, stated interest in preventing the defendant's conduct, then the Defendant's Act was justified, and you must find them not guilty. Finally, although the legislature has not formally recognized the rights of property owners or quantified the measure of authority granted to owners of private space facilities, the court recognizes that such rights and authority exist. For instance, the common law of burglary was judge-made law, which stated that uh, a, a uh, act had to be committed at night in a residence. Um, this law has been expanded by uh, 
the legislature, but it has also been continually expanded by the courts themselves. If you find that the defendants acted within the scope of their authority to ensure the safety and integrity of their facility, and if you find that they did not abuse that authority, then their act is justified and you must find them not guilty. All right, that uh, brings us down to the point where I should uh, thank the uh, individuals who served as witnesses for the defense. The first uh, speaker was Raymond Sandler. The actual name was R.B. Uh, Wasudu. Uh, Barbara Griffin was played by Meg Jordan. Mike Frank by Duncan Forbes. Uh, the programmer uh, who uh, provided Stacy, I'm sure I don't have the names here, but at any rate, we appreciate your participation. Uh, Craig Ray Miller. Mr. Miller. All right, thank you, Mr. Miller. And then Miguel Seymour was played by Carol Amato. Then we have a bailiff uh, whose name is Peter Mitchell, and we thank Peter very much for his serving in the process of having the witnesses take the now this uh, event is uh, scheduled in two parts. The first part is now just going to an end. The jury is going to deliberate. We're going to have a uh, meeting of later on this afternoon at 4.30 in this room. Uh, we'll be a polling of the jury, and we'll have some comments on the part of the judges. And then we're reserving some time for questions and answers on the part, questions on the part of the audience, and answers on the part of counsel, jury, judges, and he or she has tells his response and welcome that response. So until four <clears> thirty, <throat> I think everyone who participated come back and we'll see you uh, eventually at that time. Four thirty.